Okay. Welcome to CST8215, also known as Database. Um, the first part of today's lecture will just be a little introduction to the course. I don't spend a whole lot of time on it. Uh, the course is pretty self-explanatory as we go through it. Um, but there are a few key points I want to cover. And there we go. Now, I usually start about by introducing myself um, because it's always good to know who it is that you're, that's talking to you or talking at you, depending on the case may be. Um, I'm a college graduate, so that means that no, I don't have a university degree, I don't have a master's or a PhD. I'm coming out of the same kind of stuff as you guys did, except I did it 20-something years ago. So I got hired three days after school. And in that time, I've been unemployed for a grand total of seven days. There's lots of work in computer land. Uh, there's no lack of work, as long as you're willing to put the time in. I work full-time outside of teaching. I also teach part-time. Now, what does that mean for you guys when I say that? It means, one, surprisingly, I'm really responsive with my emails. Two, you'll get responses to your emails at weird hours. That's okay. Uh, three, my labs are very clear and concise, and usually you can do them on your own for the most part. Um, what else does it mean for you guys? It means my knowledge is current, as in I'm actively using the stuff I'm teaching you. I currently work for a company called Cadillac Technology Corporation. I can guarantee in the last five years of, uh, five, six years of teaching this course, I've had two students knew who that was. So that's two out of about a thousand students. Uh, we're a small company. We make software for sign making. Our biggest competitors are Corel and Adobe. Um, and now you're on camera. Um, we are a small shop. Uh, that means that we tend to learn things really quickly and use them as they're coming out in industry. So my knowledge is fairly current. Say, so what kind of person am I? I'm, I have a, least a, a loose and easygoing teaching style. I don't tend to have lecture notes, so don't ask for them. That's not going to happen. Um, as in, I tend to make my lectures flexible. I allow enough time in there to actually adjust depending on what's happening with the group. I don't have a checklist. I must complete this by the end of today. Uh, I will not rush through a lecture unless there's a really good reason. Um, I have been told I'm sarcastic. Exceptionally so. Um, such is life. I also tend to understand that life happens. By that I mean, hey, you walked out the door and you broke your leg. You can't make it to class. I can live with that. You suddenly are a catch pneumonia you can't submit your lab. Hot damn, I'm okay with that. Now, if you catch pneumonia every week, that's the next line where I say I don't suffer fools. I'm easygoing. I tend to be fairly forgiving. They call the, I'm what they call a, a, a soft touch, within reason. Uh, and then the sarcasm kicks in when I stop believing you. So I, the, the rule is I believe you until you give me cause to not believe you. Uh, I've also been told I'm an equal opportunity offender. I'm not politically correct. By any stretch of the imagination, I apologize now. Um, I've been known to use colorful language. And has anybody, anybody here ever been in the military? Ever dealt with someone in the military? Okay, you know about the language, right? Okay, well, software developers are just as bad. It's just when you work in the government, you tend to keep it quiet. Those that work private industry, not so much. So sometimes bad words come out, and I apologize now. Um, I will also, I also tend to not pick on my students, but I will tease my students, especially stragglers and stuff like that. It, if you, that's just life. I, I can take it too, so don't worry about it. If you want to dish it back, that's okay. Now, in the analysis, I said, don't worry about the textbooks. Uh, technically, there are two textbooks assigned for this course. I am not going to use them. We're in the middle of getting rid of them. Uh, we are in the, the myself and the other database profs are negotiating right now as to what to do about it. 
Um, the problem is we can't find a single textbook that, that crosses all the T's and dots, all the I's. However, since these are included in your tuition, it doesn't hurt for you to download and peruse them as a secondary reference. This textbook actually is really, really good. This, uh, this one by Jan Harrington, I think is a really good textbook. It just doesn't cover all the topics at the level we want it. Um, this one here, the textbook from O'Reilly, if anybody here has ever used an O'Reilly book, you'll know exactly what I'm about to say. They're great little books. They're reference manuals. Uh, this one covers all kinds of things that you'll never need for this course. That's the typical O'Reilly thing. Um, the best textbook for this course is Google. Just saying. Okay. Dan's rules for success in 82.15. Come to lecture, except for the fact that I don't take attendance. Except for the first three weeks, which lets me segue into handing out a piece of paper for people to sign. It's just for the first three weeks because we like to keep track of who actually shows up in the first three weeks. After this, I stop taking attendance. Rule number two, do your work. I think that goes without saying. We're all adults. We're all wearing our big people pants. We do the work. Hand in your work on time. Now, this is where the, the whole thing of Dan works full-time outside of teaching kicks in. I allow you guys a one-week penalty. In other words, the work is done on Friday. You're a week late. I'll take 10% off the top. If you're two weeks late, you get zero. I don't have the time to hunt you down. Which gets us back to do your work and act like an adult. If you're more than two weeks late, I give you a zero. It's automatic. Basically, I admit, it's Friday night at 12.01, I'll go zero, 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 zero for anybody who hasn't handed in the work. You make my life easier. I don't need to look at it. So it's your choice. Now, this line here, if you don't hear me sign it in class and it's not due, historically with the old LMS system we used, it would randomly change my dates on me. It happened. Uh, I have no idea what Brightspace is going to do because we're all the guinea pigs this summer. We're the ones getting the growing pains out of it. So, otherwise, if you don't hear me say that this assignment's due, then it's not due. Now, line number five, I had to change, but I didn't have a chance to change it yet. Labs are not due at the start of the next lecture because as of two weeks ago, I wasn't exactly sure what my schedule was. And I actually have a lab section before the lecture, which sucks for them. So what's happening is I'll post it. I'll put an announcement on Blackboard with the actual due dates. But essentially, labs are due the following Friday. So anybody who's got lab this week, your labs are going to be due the following week's Friday. So you get a week and a half to do your labs. It's lots of time. Uh, basically, late labs, unless you've contacted me previously, it's an automatic zero. So... Considering it's your homework, you've been given two hours of the week scheduled to do them, and basically put your uh, technically given almost two whole periods to do them, depending how you want to roll your schedule, you have no reasons not to do your labs. Okay, what can you expect this term? Uh, lectures, labs, assignments, tests. That sounds like school, doesn't it? And a two-part exam. I'll be explaining the two-part exam much later in the term. But the final exam's in two pieces, not one. Uh, lectures are free form, as I said earlier. I don't use lecture notes. Don't ask for them. Uh, apparently, I come in with a PowerPoint presentation. That's as far as it goes for lecture notes. And by the way, all these presentations are already up on, Brights on Brightspace. So if you under go look under course documents, the presentations are there. I'll be giving you guys a quick little tour of how 8215 is set up in Brightspace. Um, Labs are gradual, and they peak in difficulty at week nine. In other words, the difficulty level is pretty much like this. So it's not that bad. I have also tend to have my work time so it doesn't land during any other teacher's heavy loads. So assignments won't be due at the same time as all the other assignments. My tests aren't at the same time as the other teachers. Speaking of the tests, they're all online. I give you a whole week to do them. They're not in class. That means they're take home. They are, you have a week, an hour, they take about an hour to an hour and a half to do, and I'm giving you an entire week to do them. 
So if you can't get that test done in, in, a t in a whole week, that's, you know, sounds like a you problem, not a me problem. Okay, lecture recording. As most of you have noticed, I'm wearing a headset. Some other people may have noticed there's a little camera that with a little blue light in front of me. I record my lectures. Yeah. I try to do the recordings. They're not required of me by the school. I am not paid to do the rendering after the fact. I do them for a couple of different reasons. It's a value added service and I don't guarantee it. Now, what does that mean? I do it because A, I don't do any review. You know how some of the courses, the teacher will come in and spend the first 20 minutes talking about what they talked about last week? Not in my class. If you want to review what I talked about the week before, surprise, there's a video. It's uploaded on YouTube, which means you can watch it on your phone, on your tablet, on your PC, on whatever machine you want, on your TV even. It's there. I have a YouTube channel. It's linked on here. And you're taking pictures, but these slideshows are on Blackboard, on, Can on Brightspace anyway, so you can actually copy paste. But they're there. Uh, like I said, they're usually up within a day or two. So essentially what's going to happen is once the recording is done, tomorrow morning when I get to my day job, I'll hit the, re the render button, eventually go bing, and then I go upload to YouTube. Ta-da. Feel free to subscribe. My channel is not monetized. <laughs> I've been told I'm not allowed to do that. Um, apparently it's frowned upon trying to make money twice on the same work. So what will you be learning? You'll be learning basic database design theory. Um, considering depending on which kind of schools you go through, uh, database design could be a single terms course, half a terms course, multi-term course, depending on what level of detail you're trying to get into. Uh, you're going to learn SQL. That's the language used to talk to a database. You're going to learn about views, triggers, and stored procedures. That's way at the end of the term, and that's the part where everybody starts to cry. And then other stuff. The other stuff is, depending if I get through my lectures at a decent pace, then I cover a value extra, extra material that's just good to know. So this means that this is what they call an introductory level database course. It covers a little bit of everything, but not tons of depth on any given topic. So you learn enough about, about database to know what you don't know. So then you'll know what you need to be able to, to go keep growing your skill set. However, I've had students come out of this course and tell me that they had enough out of whatever I taught that they'd made the level two database course a joke. So if you pay attention in my class, level two database course is gonna be easy. Just saying. All right, here's the evaluation breakdown. Labs are 10%. That means each lab is worth exactly 1% of your grade. So some of you are going, oh crap, it's only 1% of my grade. Now, I've had students where that 1% made the difference between a pass and a fail. And I've had other students where it made the difference between their A and their A plus. 1%. If you don't do any of them, it's 10%. Uh, quizzes, also known as the hybrids. 10% also. I've cut one out this term, so that means there's only nine hybrids. On average, they take, the first three take all of, I don't know, half an hour to do. So there's an easy 3% of your grade. The three in the middle make people want to cry because they're quite challenging, but you have all term to do them. And then you have a couple at the end that are also easy. Two assignments worth 10% each. Um, assignment one is group work. Yay. I love it as much as you do. Assignment two is not group work. Uh, it's part of the requirements of this course that you work as a group at least once. That's what the course outline says. Two tests, 10% each. Final exam broken into two pieces. There's a theory exam and a practical exam. The theory exam is 20%. Your practical exam is 20%. I'm one of the first profs to come up with a split exam. I, I rolled that out about three years ago and it's been quite good. Um, because it gives a chance for people that are hands-on to succeed in the final exam. It gives people who suck at hands-on but are really good at memorizing stuff a chance to succeed at the exam also. 
so that they may get, you know, like 90% on one half and 20% on the other half, but they still end up with a reasonable grade. Whereas before, the exam would take two and a half hours, and half of it was handwritten stuff that I couldn't read. So then I'm guessing whether or not the person deserved, do they deserve the points? No, nope, because I can't read your handwriting. Um, this is known as what they call a 323 course. There's three hours of theory, two hours in class, one hour online hybrids. Two hours of lab, three hours of study time. Now, in theory, the three hours of study time should be fairly thin for you guys. It's probably going to be closer to like an hour and a half a week just to, or an hour a week just to review what you should have learned. I cover the material quite well in class. Uh, the PowerPoints cover almost everything you need. Um, there is an extra document for you guys to review, which will help a lot. And then here's the official to pass the course. You must. Uh, this is if you grab the course outline and you read through all the fine print inside, it summarizes down to this. You, A, must write the final exam. That means you have to show up, put your name down on the piece of paper, and answer the first question. If you're so confident of your grade that you don't think you need to write the final exam, you have to at least answer one question. And you have to get 50% of your assignments and your group work you have, and all your tests and everything. So in other words, just so you know, it means you have to get 50% in the course. It means you need to get half the, the grades for the course. Okay, supported hardware and software. This is a new slide this term. <laughs> Windows laptops. As if you read the course out the, the core the course requirements, they actually mentioned that you're supposed to be using a Windows laptop. Mac users. I feel bad for you. Um, technically you can do this on a Mac. There's a couple of ways of doing it. If you have enough hard drive space, you can install parallels or virtual PC and run it through that. Or install Windows and run it in that. Or you can install Boot Camp and run it that way. It's doable. Technically, all the software that's available for this course, they make Mac versions of, and you could theoretically run it all on your Mac. However, I will not be able to help you if you have problems with your install. So if you want to try to get the Mac version of the software, knock yourself out. The design software, I only have a Windows version. If you actually want to use the Mac version, you're going to have to pay for it yourself. It's like 10 bucks. And if you want to buy it, just let me know and I'll point you to the right place. Linux users, you glorious neckbeards. Any, ma any Linux users in here? Because they usually have one or two per term. No. Hot damn. Totally doable. You guys have the easiest life of them all. All this software is actually originally designed for Linux. <laughs> so it's two command line commands and magically you got everything you need. Um, but the Windows is probably the way to go. Um, I'll make a, a slight note about the Windows guys. Uh, depending what antivirus software you're running, you may have problems with the install. Uh, best to disable your antivirus software before you do the installs. Just saying. Or even better, just get rid of it and use what's built into Windows because it's just as good as everybody else's and it's not going to interfere anyways. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the two second tour of Brightspace and I'm in viewing it as a student. Holy crap, that's small. Let's make this a little bigger. Hello mouse. There we go. Uh, that's about as big as I can make it. Okay, so this is the student view. That's pretty much the view you guys have. I'm in pretending to be a student at the moment. And you guys have, some of you have already done the Brightspace introduction. Anybody in here not able to get into Brightspace yet? If you're having problems, you should definitely after this class or tomorrow at some point, go talk to support so they can get you sorted out. Um, under the content for the course, you will find a few different things. Under course information, Excuse me. You'll find the course outline. That is our contractual obligation between me and you. The course outline is essentially, I must cover what's in the course outline in some shape, form, or other. 
the course documents is where the majority of the content is. As I said before, the presentations have already all been uploaded. Mind you, I may tweak them a little bit as we go, so you know, I may notice as I as I scan through them before the lecture that I might find typos or weird little sentences or formatting issues. Those might, might refresh them, but the rough content is there for the whole term. So every lecture I intend to do is there. Also, in here you'll find a, a booklet here called Database Essentials, 18 Summer. Oh, it's going to open up right in the main window. Okay. Oh, that's terrible looking this way. Hang on, let me just open that up in another, on another screen here. Because earlier I said you don't need the textbook. Why? Because I've give I've basically whipped together or the equivalent of a textbook for you guys. It every topic I'm going to cover this term is in this booklet. It is. 97 pages long. Everything I'm going to talk about, everything you're tested on, is in this book. So when it's open book, or let me go that way, depending which screen you're looking at. Um, I apologize about the terrible grammar and the weird, the possibly bad sentences and references that aren't there. I assembled, because as we were getting rid of the textbooks, I assembled all the different documents I've written for students over the last 10 years of teaching database in various courses and made a concise version of it for you guys. It's just someone where you refer to say, oh, if you look at this document, <laughs> it's not there. I've been skimming it as much as I can, but if you notice any glaring errors, let me know so I can fix them. I'll appreciate that. Um, but basically everything you need for this course is in here. Um, so I strongly recommend that you download that document Put it on your laptop. If you've got a really good printer at home, feel free to print it out. I won't feel offended. Feel free to share with friends and family. It's not copyrighted. Some of the articles in there came from people I know in the industry that allowed me to use their articles for free without giving attribution. I said, do you mind if I use that article? Yes. Do you want me to attribute it? I don't care. Okay. Good enough. Um... There's a few other documents in here that you guys will need later on that you may want to look at. They're just there for your reference. Now, the meat and potatoes of the course. There's assignments, labs, hybrids, and tests. No point going into the assignments right now. We'll go through those when it's time. The labs are here, and they're all there. And now you should be able to see all of them. Even though before you could only see the one. Apparently there's something about Brightspace I didn't understand. I have been rectified. So you are able to see all my labs. Which leads me to my announcement about labs. As you've noticed, I've posted my lab locations and times. Except for the first week where I'd like you to come to your normally assigned lab, or actually the first couple of weeks, I'd like you to come to your normally assigned lab after the first couple of weeks as people start shaking out and some people stop coming to labs because that's normal. You can come to any of those lab sections. I don't care which one you come to. It, uh, mind you, if you come to the 5 o'clock lab on Wednesdays and there's no room for you, well, that's TFB. There's no room for you. You'll have to wait till somebody moves out of the room. Um, which leads me to, I don't take attendance in labs either. What's the point if I let you come to whatever lab you want? Which also leads you to the rest of the information about uh, Brightspace, where you'll notice there's a CST215-310, then there's a 311, a 312, a 313, and a 314, depending on which sections you're in. Ignore everything but 310. I've even put a little announcement there saying, don't come here, there is nothing here. Unlike Blackboard, which is the old LMS system where I could turn off the course so you guys couldn't even see it, I can't make it go away right now. It's been requested, but we can't make it go away. But everything you need for this course is in 310. So don't even bother going anywhere else. Under the hybrids, you, there's links, and then there's a quiz. You click on the quiz, 
you answer the questions. It tells you right away how you did. And hopefully it's set up right. Cross my fingers. If it doesn't, let, just let me know. You should be able to try them as many times as you want. Just keep doing them until you get 100% or not. I don't care. It's your choice. Um, tests, well, those are tests. Recordings currently empty. Why? Because this is recording number one. In this section, you'll have a link to the appropriate YouTube video. So as I upload it to YouTube, once it, YouTube tells me the video is ready, I'll put a link in there and ta-da. Away it goes. Okay. Now, we're going to get into the meat and potatoes things. Okay, so where's the attendance sheet? Oh, there it is. Attendance sheet's made it there. Make sure you sign that today. If you have, for those of you that arrived late are sitting over here, <laughs> um, it's gonna, that sheet will make it its way to me eventually and come back to sign it later. Just saying. Uh, I, like I said, I don't take attendance except I'm required to take it for the first two, three weeks just so we can keep track of students that never showed up at all. You'd be surprised. I usually have five a term that just don't bother to show up. So welcome to lecture one officially. Now we're done with the introduction. And week one is basically theory. The first three weeks of this course is theory heavy. Um, there are historically two ways of teaching database. There's the, I do one hour theory day, then a one hour of practical concepts. Do, to do, to do, to do. Or you do it like I do, which is do the, the database theory at the beginning so that when you actually start messing with the insides, you have the background behind it. Both methods work equally well. Different teachers do it differently. This is the way I do it. I like it done this way. Um, I'm what they call a uh, continuous evaluation style teacher, as in once I've evaluated it on a topic, I don't go back to it. If you've proven to me you know the stuff, good enough. The only the final exam is where it all comes back for a visit. So, today we're going to talk about what is a database. Now, what is a database? This is the short version of it. Technically, we have to first talk, start talking, what is data? And a lot of people have interesting ideas of what data actually is. Now, data is information, essentially. And it, it could be anything. Whether it's a person, an activity, a location, an event, uh, a building, you know, a cat. It's all information. And information is made up of things. And I use the word things a lot at the first lecture um, until I define the meaning of things. But th some of the things that make up a person would be a name, their sex, their date of birth, height, weight, where they come from. That kind of stuff. That's all data. And essentially a database is a collection of data. So I take, we take all this data, we organize it, and we shove it into a, into a computer program and magic happens. Um, and as someone who's been doing database development for 20 years, there's an awful lot of magic in there. Um, I'll be honest. Yeah, I look at it some days and go, that's cool. Then I got students that show me stuff I've never seen before because they did something I never expected. Well, that's cool too. I didn't know. You could do that. Now, normally at this point I have a short, like, two-minute discussion about what do you guys think is a database? So when you think about your life every day and you think about different things that could be a database, what are some of the things you think might be a database? Uh, try that again. I barely caught you. Yeah, a calendar could be technically a database. Anybody else got an idea? Yeah. I got two. Um, you go first. No, Excel's not a database. Excel's a spreadsheet. You can use it as a database if you're a fool. Excel is a spreadsheet. It comes back in the old days, the old accounting, where you had the big pieces of paper with all the columns, the ledgers. Basically, those are electronic ledgers. Just people have abused them to the point where they treat them like a database. 
but they're not a database. Yeah, warehouse management system is an example of another database. Uh, you'd be surprised. You can take it a little closer to home, though. <laughs> Facebook? Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> That's a database. Yes? Yeah, oh, yeah. Terry's got a good database on everybody in, well, every Canadian in here. They know more about you than you'd think they know. Uh, you'd be really surprised how much the CRA knows about you. How many of you have one of these? Okay, is there a contact list in your phone? It's actually running a database that's built in. Specifically, if you're running Android, it's using a database system called SQLite. Just so you know. And that's what the contact book is on an Android phone. Most Android phones, except for Samsung, because they suck. Um, they, they decide to write their own. Everything they can do, everybody else does. They said we can do it better. They write their own, and it's always weird. But they actually use a database also, but they recreate their own database engine. There was a hand over here. There. Her phone book? Yeah, her paper phone book. That technically counts as a database. You were talking about the phone. Yeah, phone books are all data. Okay. So you're starting to see a pattern here. Basically, it's just collections of information that are organized in a similar manner. Okay. As the image here, prehistoric Googling. For those of us that are past a certain age, remember these things. They're called card files. I'm not going to ask you to self-identify. That puts you past a certain age, probably about past 37. <laughs> and uh, I spent lots of detentions in high school rebuilding the card files. I wasn't a troublesome kid. I just got in trouble. And no, really, it just I was always in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, they were so used to seeing me there, they just sent me to the library automatically. But that was a database. Essentially, every card contained the exact same piece of information, the title of a book, the author, the uh, Dewey Decimal number for it, a short description of what the book was. But every card was organized the same way. And you, if you knew how to use the card files, you could actually find stuff. Um, Many organization systems have come out over the years. And there's been all kinds of them. They've been around for, technically, the concept of a database has been around for hundreds, if not thousands of years. The Romans were great at organizing information. Go figure that one out. Um, anybody here ever deal with an accountant? Have to work with an accountant. <laughs> They're the best people to work with. Um, they're really they like their boxes, which leads me to the next thing. They like organizing things in boxes. That's the reason why they're called bankers' boxes. And they like putting things in boxes. They like their filing cabinets. They like their paper. And every accountant seems to have their own organization system. But essentially, everything that goes into certain filing cabinets are organized the same way. They actually have a mental database where they know where stuff goes in a physical location. The accounts are basically a database servers. And the filing cabinets are their hard drives. So we described a bit before what data was and talked about the box. Starting with a bit more history, because history is important to know. To understand where you are now, it's important to know where you were before. Now, I've got four slash five, six stack commercial database servers listed on here. Of course, there's always Oracle. Oracle's always at the top. Whenever you think about database servers, Oracle always comes at the top. Oracle's been around forever. It was the first cross-platform database server. Now, what does that mean? There once was a time when you bought a computer system, which happened to be, you know, three times the size of this desk. It came with a database. The database belonged to the person that made, the person that wrote this database system also created the OS and the computer. Basically, you bought an IBM mainframe, you used IBM's database, whatever the heck it was. If you bought a server from HP, you were using HP's. If you bought some from digital equipment, which no longer exists, you were using digital equipment's database. Oracle was the, this is where Oracle became the thing. They created a database server that ran on more than one system. You say, I'm running a VACT. Here's Oracle. Oh, I'm running true Unix. Have, a, have Oracle. It works on, well, everything. But that's what made their, they were the first one to break out into 
same database server, multiple environments. IBM said, that's a great idea, we'll do the same thing. They released DB2. And, you know, nobody hears about DB2, but it's still out there. Um, whole sections of the school runs on DB2, just so you know. A big section of the Canadian government runs on DB2. Big parts of it run on Oracle. Most of it runs on COBOL. But they're there. DB2 is massive. It runs on mainframes. Uh, down this way, I think. It runs on mainframes. I've even seen, they actually, for a while, they had a version that ran on Android 4. Just so you know, it scales. Um, SQL Server and Sybase. SQL Server is from Microsoft. Sybase is from, was originally from Sybase. Now it's owned, I think, by Computer Associates. Or maybe SAP. I don't know. They've been bought so many times, it's not funny. Why are they on the same line? There once was a time where the University of Waterloo had a product called Watcom SQL. They decided they were going to start leasing the technology out. Microsoft came out and says, I want it. Sybase came, a startup called Sybase says, I want it. They said, they agreed to not compete with each other. Microsoft will stay in Windows. Sybase will stay on the Unix-like systems. So SQL Server 6, come, no, 5 comes out. Sybase SQL Anywhere 2 comes out. And Sybase ran on Windows and Unix. SQL Server 5 ran on Unix and Windows. That, that the agreement lasted all of two weeks. And they started stabbing each other in the back as fast as they could. Um, however, the cool thing was is that their systems were binary compatible until SQL Server 7, which was five years later, and SQL Server, uh, Sybase SQL Enterprise, I guess it was called, they were compatible with each other for five or six years after they started releasing. You could literally take the, the raw database files off the hard drive, copy them to the other one, they work. It was magic. Uh, now, long story short on that one is, uh, most people have heard of Microsoft SQL Server, Nobody hears about Sybase anymore. So we all know how well that fight went. Uh, then there's DBase and Access. My first database system was DBase. Other people would have been Access. Those are what they call desktop database servers or applications. Uh, Mac users may have heard of a program called FileMaker. Same idea, a little more special, but same idea. And these were what they call small work group databases. As somebody would write up a database and share it with their work group, and they all lived happily ever after. Uh, DBase is there's a doorknob. Uh, access is terrible. Uh, but they, they were part of history. Uh, early 90s, mid 90s, the open source side of the world started picking up speed. In my last year of college, Linux 1.0 came out, literally 1.0. I was in my third year of college. Not long after that, there was this product called MySQL that came out. MySQL 1.0 came out. That was the first open source database. MySQL is like foot fungus. It's everywhere. And you can't get rid of it. Uh, MySQL was bought by Oracle about 10 years ago. And they promptly killed development for about five years. Now they're developing it again. It's still out there. It's been forked half a dozen times. Uh, there's other products that are compatible with it called MariaDB is one. There's a few others. Uh, all is a standard, as in every web hosting provider provides MySQL compatibility. If you have a website, you can pretty much guarantee they're running MySQL somewhere. Postgres QL. That nice long name, has a very checkered history of its own. This is the one we use in this course. Once upon a time, Berkeley had a database system called Ingress, and it was a commercial database. They decided to piggyback on Oracle. They said, Oracle, this is great to run on everything. We'll do the same thing. We'll make some money for, my for our university. Well, we all know it's only football that makes money for the university. But they tried to sell this product commercially and they sold it for a while. Then they released the source code, open source. But they didn't want the, the guys who took over the source code decided we don't want to be quite known as ingress free. We want to be known as what came after ingress. So we called ourselves Postgres. Never said computer guys were clever. 
And then the SQL standard magically appeared and said, oh, this is a great idea. Let's bolt it on top. So now it became PostgreSQL. Postgres, which a lot of people say, come to me, go, why are we using Postgres for this course? Why don't we use MySQL or SQL Server or whatever? I go, because for a few reasons. One, Postgres is light, as in it's not going to hurt your computer. Two, it is widely used in the industry. It's just nobody knows it's out there. It's like the hidden ninja running things in the background. How many of you have a PlayStation? I'm assuming you play online. Really? There's only like eight of you? That's a new one. PlayStation. Two, three or four. I don't care which one. Okay. You know when you log on, you go online and you log in, you're, you're connecting, they're actually, you're being authenticated through a Postgres service. Um, anybody here ever hear, of, well actually everybody here has heard of Yahoo. Yahoo runs on Postgres. Terrible that it's Yahoo, but you know, it runs on Postgres. Uh, so many big corporations use it. Uh, it's all over the place. Um, it is the first database that was sent to the ISS. It's running on the ISS. First database in orbit. It's everywhere. It is the number one replacement database for, for people trying to get away from Oracle. As in they're tired of paying the $50,000 a year for Oracle, so they move over to Postgres because Postgres does pretty much everything Oracle does. But it does it for And it runs on everything. I mean, absolutely everything. It runs on cell phones. It runs on laptops. It runs on mainframes. It runs in pretty much everything. There was a joke once that somebody got it running on a toaster. Not quite, but it runs on absolutely everything. They made. They actually had a version that ran on the old Macs. Not those Macs. The Macs that came before those Macs. You know, the Mac OS 9, Mac OS 8, Postgres ran on that. Technically, you could get it running on an Apple IIe if you really wanted to try. It's doable. I wouldn't recommend the experience, though. Come on. Actually, I forgot to go full screen with this. There we go. Now, why would you want to use a database? I guess it never made it down here. So who hasn't signed the attendance yet? Which section? Oh, look at that. Nice. Okay, send it up and down this here. You guys got all got skipped. <laughs> okay. Why would you use a database? Number one, you want to use it for data storage. It's designed to store data. That means it's really, really good at it. You know, it's like using single purpose tools. There's some tools that are really good at doing certain jobs, and they're only good for doing specific jobs. I'm trying to think of one off the top of my head. Uh, anybody here ever do any kind of carpentry? Do you ever see that little, that cool little saw you can use to cut the bottoms off of uh, door frames? Yeah, that's pretty much the only thing it can do, but man, does it ever good to do a good job doing it. Database servers are a single purpose thing. They do one job and they do it well, they store data. Database servers force you to organize your data. Now, when I say forces you to organize your data, it means that, yeah, it'll organize your data if you do a good job setting it up. If your organization looks like your dog threw up, your data is going to be organized just as well. But it allows you to organize the data. It's designed for retrieving data, and it's, done, it's designed to do it really fast. Why? What's the point of storing data if you can't get it back out in a hurry? Also, it's good for rep doing reporting. How many of you get pieces of mail that have been personalized? Dear Daniel, he, we at Rogers would like you to come back and be one of our customers. I haven't been your customer for 20 years. But I'd like you to come back and be your customer. But they personalized it for me so I feel nice, warm, and fuzzy. That's, all, that's known as a mail merge. They my name's in one of their databases, they run it through a printing service, it gets folded, put in an envelope, and off it goes. Or you get personalized emails. Now that's the more common way of doing mail merges. How many of you get at least one piece of crap mail with your name on it a day? Right? We it used to cost 40 cents to send you a piece of mail, now they do it for free. But it's still a mail merge because it's been personalized to you. Um, other things, they're good for is business intelligence. And now, for those that have been in Ottawa for a long time, 
probably remember a company called Cognos. They were one of the darlings of the technology golden age in Ottawa. Back at the same time as Nortel was still a thing. And Alcatel-Lucent was still a thing. And Dell said they were going to open up a call center for 3,000 jobs and they shut it down three months later. But there once was a time where there was this company called Cognos. They were on Riverside Drive. Anybody here go up Riverside Drive and see the big IBM buildings? That used to be Cognos. IBM bought Cognos and then shut them down. <laughs> they competed. Buy the competition, kill them. IBM's way. And there's another one called Crystal Reports. Essentially what it does you do is allows you to connect to a database server, automate the reports so that reports go out automatically to all the managers so they don't need to know how to use a computer. They just get an email with all the information for the day. That's called business intelligence. Now, this is actually technically one of the things that are, we're supposed to cover in this term, and it's such a dumb thing to actually cover with level one students because it's not something you'll learn to ever have to do. So I covered day one. So I can say I filled, fulfilled my contractual obligation to you to talk about this topic. How do you pick your database? And essentially, it's like anything else. Number one, what are you planning to do with it? Are you going to be keeping track of your cat pictures? Or are you going to use it to organize your sports league? different loads? Or is there going to be more than one person connecting and using it? Or is there going to be an entire company using it? Depending on what your target is, what you're planning to do with it, it will change what your target is, obviously. The more people you want to use it, obviously you're not going to go and use access if you've got a thousand people. It's a bad idea. What kind of volume and traffic, which essentially brings it back? Is your database going to be all of five megs? Hot damn, use MySQL. Oh, it's going to be 16 terabytes. Uh, now we're down to one to choice of three different products. Four. Oracle DB2, technically Microsoft SQL Server, if you will, and spend 60 grand, and Teradata. Postgres is catching up, though. Um, what's your budget? And usually when you think about your budget, people say, oh, I want to spend X amount of dollars on my server hardware. And every time somebody says, oh, but you want to spend on your hard server? Oh, I don't know, about 1500 bucks. I'm like, ha, 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 No. Uh, you might as well try to run it on your cell phone. Your cell phone probably has better specs than a $1,500 server. Software. Do you have a budget for your software? Most people say, well, I'll use open source. It's free. Great. So how much are you going to spend on the people training them so they know how to use it? And I can guarantee the most expensive purchase of any database server is the people. Database admins are expensive. Database architects are more expensive. Tech support is expensive. On average, most corporations have a database server. A company of 50 people or less will have one database admin, specialist, and a helper. Guess who that is where I work? I'm the database admin. I've got a guy that piggybacks for me. Larger corporations will have entire departments dedicated to it, and they'll have level one, level twos, and that kind of stuff. People are more expensive. I have, you know, if you think about an average salary, seventy to one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, for depending if you work for the government or not. And you know that's a good chunk of change. If you got three of those people at seventy grand, that's you know, $210,000 a year, and then you're complaining about not wanting to spend on a $1,500 server. Maybe if you have, you know, you spend a little more, you might not need as many people to maintain it. It balances out. Do you have platform limitations? Do you work in a shop that everything is Windows? Well, at that point, you've got the choice of two servers. Are you in a shop where everything is Linux? Congratulations, you can't use Microsoft products. Are you in a Mac shop? Their Mac, uh, Apple actually had servers for a while. They were actually pretty good. A little weird. Like everything else Apple does, but it was pretty good. What database servers could you use on it? I think three. Um, do you have some policies? For example, I once had a job interview with the government of Nova Scotia, and I asked them, what, what's your server environment? They said, we're 100% Microsoft's shop. I'm like, ha ha, that's policy. Wow, no wonder their taxes are so bad. 
And then there's other considerations. Do you already have a long-standing contract? Are you already an Oracle shop? Well then, guess what you're using? Because it might be in the contract that says you're not allowed to use anything else. You'd be surprised what's in those contracts. Do you care about support? As in, do you want to be able to pick up a phone and get somebody else to fix your problem for you? Trust me, that's worth a lot of money. And then there's the alignment of the stars. By that, it's always the generic statement, alignment of the stars. As in, you're sitting there at your desk and your manager comes in and goes, I read this weekend in a magazine that this is the best product ever. Guess what? The stars just aligned to shit on your bed because it's not going to be a good day after that. Alignment of the stars. There could be just some random reason why you have to pick something that you normally wouldn't use. But those are the questions you have to go through when you go to pick a database. Normally, you can get away at least at a starting point with a free one. And then if you need more horsepower, then you go to the not free. Okay, now for some terminology. Now we're done with history lessons and that kind of stuff. The structure of a database is made of tables, views, and relations. Th uh, those will be detailed, <laughs> obviously. I'm not going to say databases are made out of tables. Done. We're done talking now. No. There's tables, views, and relations, and then other stuff. There's lots of stuff inside there. However, um, a table. A table is a holding bin. So when you think about the physical organization of a database. Okay. I think it's I think we've hit everybody. Oh, it's got some more over there. Oh, and then we got some more over here. You're good? Okay. So when you think about a table, and I, for once I'll use the Excel example. When you look at Excel, and how many of you have actually seen a spreadsheet? Excel, Numbers, Google, whatever the hell it is, uh, OpenOffice, LibreOffice, whichever one you use, Calc, Lotus123 for those that are past a certain age. Spreadsheets. Essentially, you're used to seeing a concept where there's columns and rows. It's a grid of information. Technically, that's not how it's stored inside the table, but that's how we think about them. What's stored inside of the table is like binary gobbledygook. You can't open up a table and actually look at what's inside because it's just noise. But that noise is made up of, the, that's why the database server is kind of magical because it takes that noise and turns it into something else. But it's made out of rows and columns. And there's other attributes such as um, defaults and basic rules and indexes and stuff like that. We cover that kind of stuff later in the term. But... A database table is made out of columns. A column, now we get to the nitty gritty of things. A column holds a discrete piece of information. Now, another word that is often used instead of the word discrete is the word atomic. And atomic is actually a really good word to use for this. Because when you think of an, uh, an atom, it is the smallest piece you can do before you split and things go boom, right? Therefore, when something is atomic, that means it's the smallest piece you can work with. Therefore, what do you think about a person? And you think about their different attributes that make them up. Those are different columns. For example, you'd have a person's name, and depending how you decide to do it, You'd have a first name, a middle name, and a last name. Unless you have a Hispanic name, then you have a first name, a first name, a first name, three middle names, and at least two last names. I'm kidding. But I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> or, depending, there's some parts of the world where people only have one name. Just one name. And depending on where, the, so I said the data is kind of fluctuates depending on where you are. However, a name is not a very, a very atomic piece of information. That one you have to decide how atomic you want it to be. However, a person's date of birth is very atomic. It is a specific value that doesn't change. It doesn't vary. As long as you're working with the Gregorian calendar, your date of birth is the same. It's the same kind of information for everybody. You know, 
March 7th, 1970 something. Now, January 6th, 1998. Those are specific atomic pieces of information. Another atomic piece of information would be your SIN number, if you're Canadian, or your SSN number, if you're American, or whatever applies to you wherever you're from. Basically, your government-issued numeric ID. That is an atomic value. It's not broken down into smaller pieces. Each of these columns have a name. As in, you should be able to identify this piece. In other words, what's a good name for a column called that holds a person's name? I don't know. Name? Someone holds your date of birth. I don't know. Date of birth? You give it a name. When you think about other stuff like addresses, you'd have address, city, province, postal code, or state and zip code or whatever. Phone number is a phone number. That kind of stuff. Everything has a data type. Now, I'm not going to talk about data types now. That comes down later. Um, talking data types with level ones on day one is always not a good idea. Uh, but I can talk about it in generic terms. A data type would be, is it text? Is it a number? Is it a yes, no? As in known as a Boolean, a true, false, yes, no. Those are data types. There's actually much more precise data types, but you know, I'm talking in general. You got a piece of text, which could be letters and numbers. You could have a date of birth, which is a date, an actual date. Numbers, you know, five, there's a number. And then there's defaults. So that's sometimes you have a default value as in, nowadays it's really, I really have a hard time to come up with an example of a default without offending someone. Um, but as a default, you could say active, true or false. As in not active, as in are you going to go run laps around the school, as in are you a piece of information that's currently active, as in you're currently all students at the college, therefore you're all active students. If you graduated three years ago and you haven't gone back to school, you're no longer an active student. So that's what I mean by, so therefore you could default that if you're attending courses, you're by default active. All right, so common data types. I just talked about how I'm not going to cover a whole lot of them. Um, car and var car, I'll talk, talk about those in more detail in lecture three. But that's text, basically. Um, letters and numbers. Numerics and decimals. Those are like prices for those that don't know what a decimal is. You know, 1995. Congratulations, it's better than, you know, 20 bucks because it's five cents cheaper. Uh, integers. How many people here don't know what an integer is? Because it's time to go back to high school math. Integers are whole numbers with no decimal places. Text and memo. Those are fields that hold lots of text. <laughs> pages and pages. So if ever you look at a website and there's a whole article on the screen, that's probably going into a text field. Dates. Date times and timestamps. We all know what a date is. We all know what time is. Congratulations, you put a date and a time together. You got a date, time, or a timestamp. Booleans, as I just described, the yes, no situation. And then there's blobs. And I put in the good old yes, 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 oh no. No, no, no. Don't use blobs. That's, I cover those later in the term, but blobs are terrible. They stand for binary large objects. It's when somebody thinks it's a great idea to take every song they have and shove it inside of a database server. I'm going to take every picture from my hard drive and put them all inside of a database server because I'm cool. And later on the term, when I talk about why you don't do this, you'll understand why it's yes, 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 no, no, no. All right, what is a row? A row is also known as a record. It's a collection of columns that belong to a single record. In other words, let's think about students in this room. You all have certain attributes that you share. You all have names. You all have a date of birth. You have s all some sort of unique government issued identifier. Right, if you're Canadian or a Canadian citizen or a landed immigrant, you probably have a SIN number. If you're American, you have an SSN number. If you're a foreign exchange student, you either have a visa number or a passport number. That's basically how we to identify you in the system. You have, God help me, gender. You have 
other things such as your address, your phone number, your personal email address, all that information. So that, everybody shares the same set of attributes. So therefore, in this case, technically, each single one of you are a different record. Because you all share the same attributes, that means you all have the same columns, but the values inside each of those columns are different on a person-by-person -person basis. So you're all technically records in a database. And it always seems a little disingenuous when I say that, because people say, well, I can't feel offended. What do you think you are to access when you log into Access and find out what your timetable is? What I just described is pretty much everything they have inside of Access about you. Your home phone number, your, your personal email address. Magically enough, it's all stored in there. Um, you guys are all individual records. So when you want to think about a database server, you want to think about a table. So basically a table is, an or is a collection of records. So we can go visualizing this room. Let's pretend this room is called students. So pretend I'm not in this room because I'm not a student. But this room is called tabled called students. We have a certain description that describes every student, as in you all share common attributes. In other words, common columns. Name, etc., etc., etc. And each of you are an instance of one of those records. Therefore, you guys are a collection of data organized a certain way, stored in a certain bin. Thus, this school is a database, this room is a database table, and each of you are records in this database table. Is the, is the only way I've ever found to really explain the basic concept of what each piece is without actually getting into these long-winded terminology heavy discussions that nobody actually ever understands. And I get confused halfway through it and I forget what I'm talking about. Um, but this is the best way to think about it. So when you want to think about a record of data, think about yourself, that you're a record inside of a room. Yes, you're a unique individual upon yourself. Whether you're a special snowflake or not, you're still a unique person. However, you share the same attributes as everybody else in this room. As in, by attributes, I mean things that can be used to describe you. Now, primary keys is a topic I actually spend a fair amount of time on later on, but it's good to give it to you guys now so it has time to start percolating. I like giving extra pieces of information at the beginning so it has time to slowly start percolating and saying, oh, I've heard that word before. Primary keys is one of the most basic pieces inside of a database table. It's what enforces uniqueness. This is what allows every record to be its own special snowflake. It's important because you have to be able to uniquely identify every single one of you. Now, as far as the school is concerned, what does it use to uniquely identify every single one of you? Student number. Surprisingly enough, it usually takes longer for that answer to be given out. I must have done a better job explaining earlier. Student number. You all have a student number. If you don't have a student number, you're in the wrong room. Well, fine, I have an employee number, but same difference. I have a number too. And each of you have a unique num number, and it's your student number. It allows the school to uniquely identify you as an individual. And surprisingly enough, we can't use your username. We can't really use your name as we uniquely identify you. Why? Lots of people have the same names. And depending on your cultural background, often you'll have three or four people in the same room with the same name. It's just what it is. Do we have any um, wings in the room? N-G-U-Y, the Vietnamese wings, where half the country has the same last name, literally. That's not a joke. Um, you know, that's an example of a culture where everybody has the same last name. Hey, heck, there's even people there with th that are wing-wing. They have the last names the same as their first name. And there's other cultures that do that too. You can't use a person's name to uniquely identify them. You can't use their date of birth to uniquely identify someone. Why? I don't know how many people here have a birthday on or near March 7th, for example. I'll be surprised, actually. Usually I just get one. None. Okay. That's rare. Uh, but, you know, 
people have similar dates of birth. It's, you can't use that as a unique identifier. If you go down to the minute of their birth, like really? If I take the whatever number of students are enrolled at Algonquin in a given year, 50,000 students, do you think nobody has the same date of birth? Can't use that either. You can't even use date of birth and a name. Why? Here's a weird flu fluke when I was a kid. I was born at March 7th. A girl I started dating in high school was also born on March 7th. She had the same last name as me, although we weren't related. No, really, we weren't. <laughs> Her last name was spelt different. But it was the same last name. It was just a cultural thing. And we had the same first name except for the spelling. It was the freakiest thing ever. We didn't even know we had the same date of birth. Then I found out literally she was actually in the crib next to me at the hospital. Town, 9,000 people. Right? So 9,000 people, two people are, you know, that close name and date. That's kind of freaky. But it happens. So out of 50,000 people, you can't use combination name and date, birth. And people say, well, we could use the SSN number or their SIN number. Great. However, depending on where you're from, we, you don't, you, we can't use your SIN number or your SSN number because you don't have one. Or whatever your government uses doesn't apply to Canada. So we use your student visa number or your passport number. And depending where your passport's from, it's just a number. Or your visa, student visa number, is just a number. Now, SSN numbers are only nine digits in Canada, but surprisingly enough, I've seen some student visa numbers that also have only nine digits. What are the odds that they piggyback and overlap? Better than you'd think. Therefore, in the end, what happens is the school decided to create a brand new magic number. And it is a magic number because they just generate it automatically and just gets added one, two, three, four, five at infinitum. So now we're at whatever, 400 and something, 4 million or something like that. Where the number is at now, that's how many people have been registered as a student over the years. Hey? Okay? Well, take your student number, strip off the first zero. That's your, that's your spot since student number one. Huh? 40 million. So I'm pretty sure they didn't start at one, but I'm just using that. But technically, often I'll have, if I were to say, okay, give me your student number, and, I, and in the room there'll be three other people within one digit, up and down. Because you all, a lot of people will just sign up one after another for the same courses. It's just how it happens. So a primary key is a column or an attribute that's been created or used to uniquely identify you. Student number is your identifier. And I cover a short introduction to relations. Our, as these are connections between database objects. In other words, you've got tables, and there's connections between them. And for example, then this is the one that all of you will understand. So most of you are probably a computer programmer, right? CP? Probably got a, usually there's three or four that are in CET because they have to, you know, they want to get ahead of the game or whatever, insert reason here while they're here again. They're in CT. So you're in CP. While you're in CP, how many courses are you taking right now? Six. Five to six depending, or you've been exempted less. Right? So you as a student are taking six courses. That means you have six profs. Each prof teaches a course. So each prof has n number of students. Therefore, there's a relation between each professor and a group of students. Each student has a relation between themselves and a group of profs. Each prof has a section or a set of rooms. So there's a relation between you, the course, and the rooms. These are all relations. These are how things are all interconnected. Just like the person who cracked about the CRA earlier, how the CRA has base. There's a relation between you and every tax return you ever filed. There's also a relation between you, the tax return, and the employers that provided the information. Those are relations. Those are objects that are interrelated. We're super simplifying the concepts at the moment, but that's what a relation is. It's connection between things. Just like you might be related to people, whether you want to be or not, you're related. It's a relation. 
technically you have a relation with everybody in this room. You're all connected to each other by the fact that you're all sharing the same course. Therefore, there's a thing called CST 8215. You're all taking it. One course, X number of students, N number of students. That means I am connected to you via this database course. Therefore, I have N number of students. You guys have one prof for this course. Those are all relations. So you're all related to each other via me or via the database course, depending how you want to do the math or the logic jumps. Those are relations. So that allows you to make the connections between things so that later on when you need to figure out how things are connected in the database, if you've established proper relations, it makes it easier because it makes sense. Those are relations. And that's the end of that one. Okay. Now, usually my first lecture is usually pretty short, as we notice. We're done 45 minutes early. Um, just so you know what you need to accomplish this week. Uh, number one is get to do your lab one, if you're able to. Why? If you don't have lab one done, you're going to have a hard time doing the work for this course. Such is life. Number two, uh, you want to suck down that uh, database essentials booklet that I have on Brightspace. And you probably want to give chapter one a skim. Why? Because, strangely enough, the chapters cover roughly the same material as I'm covering it in the order I'm covering the course. Therefore, parts of chapter one mimics what I covered today, but done in different words with different examples and a little bit of different expansion in different areas. Um, those are the top two things. Number three, if you don't have a working computer, and I'm not making fun of you, because there are always usually half a dozen students that are having issues at the start of the term. My computer's in the mail. My dog pissed on my computer. You think I'm kidding? <laughs> I've seen it. Sent me pictures to prove. I'm like, that's gross. Don't ever touch that again. Or they have an older computer they're discovering they can't do the job. And I've actually had students come in with computers that are 10 years old thinking they can do this. And then it takes 10 minutes for Windows to load. So ideally, you should get your computer situation figured out. But this applies for all the courses, <laughs> except maybe communications and achieving success. Um, so you need to get your environment set up so that you can start doing the work. I've released all the labs already. Some of you may have noticed I fixed it so you can actually see all the labs. If you get lab one done, congratulations, you can start in on lab two. I don't care. Technically, you can do lab two without any lecture. Why? I timed my lab so there's some fuzz at the beginning a bit so that we can get ramped up with the theory so we can actually cover the material properly. Applied. And there's no point doing applied work unless you've covered some of the material. Therefore, the first couple of labs, you can sit down and just start going through it. Um, you should contemplate doing some of the hybrids, especially hybrid one. It's just a thought. You technically are allocated two hours, uh, three hours a week for study time, according to the rules of the school. So it's three hours of study time for this course. The hybrid should take you 20 minutes. What do you do with the rest of your time? <sighs> For a guy, I don't know. Try to find a way to get Skyrim to run on something else. I have no idea. Um, but, you know, go walk your dog. Go have a beer. I don't care. Uh, but that's what you need to accomplish by the by next week is you need to be have your stuff installed and prepared to do work. Start reading that booklet. Like I said, that's basically the tests are based on what's inside that booklet. And... If you have any questions, feel free to email me. I will try to answer them. Other than that, I'm going to hit the stop record button in a second, and you're all free to run. Please bring me the attendance sheet, whoever has it. <laughs>